Hey traders, happy Sunday. Welcome to this week's FX Commodities and Crypto Game Plan. Let's get into the news that matters. So China remains front and center for news that matters for us. Uh, the property sector being the key there, as we believe this property situation is definitely far from over. And what we're seeing this week is an acceleration of risks um, unfolding in the Chinese property sector, starting with um, CNBC reporting that China's property market could see more pain even as the Evergrande crisis seems to be abating. So it's not just about Evergrande anymore. And as we've been saying over the last few weeks, Evergrande was just kind of the leading indicator of what's going to be occurring. The Evergrande crisis seems to be abating, but the the property markets is definitely in for more pain. Um, some things that we saw this week was Kaiser Group Holdings missing a payment on a wealth management product um, and suspending the stock in the Hong Kong listed or on the Hong Kong exchange. It's basically a wealth management product. You can uh, easily just replace that with mortgage-backed security and you have the same thing of what brought down the US housing market back in 07, 08 with the housing crisis there. A wealth management product, basically to easily explain it is um, the government stepped in to curb this lending that was happening, this overheated property market that was uh, already an issue for the Chinese government um, from last year already. And banks were forced to cut their lending or cut their exposure in the property mortgage or mortgage lending to around about 40% on their balance sheets. And they were given three years to do that. But the problem is because the housing market was so hot, the demand for the, that debt, the demand for mortgages was still there. So all these banks did was uh, refinance or re-engineer these financial products into what they call wealth management products so they could take it off their balance sheet uh, into the shadow banking, shadow banking sector and which allowed for them to maintain that 40% barrier or that 40% regulatory hurdle uh, while keeping the demand or keeping the supply of credit going to these creditors. That's exactly what happened in the U.S. in 08 or 09, or in, in the U.S. in the 2008 financial crisis, where we had those mortgage-backed securities coming into play. Now we have them what's called labeled as wealth management products in China, and Kaiser Group is already missing payments on those wealth management products. So this, this is a huge sector. The shadow banking sector in China is massive. And we, like we reported last week, we're starting to see these non-performing loans AKA wealth management products or hidden non-performing loans, especially um, in the form of wealth management products come to light. Uh, and what's important to note is that China's 10 largest developers owe a combined $1.65 trillion as reported by Bloomberg. Uh, so it's definitely starting to come to light how much is actually on these balance sheets and in the shadow backing sector that is owed and how much these uh, local banks are in trouble. Uh, beyond that, the Shimao Group Holdings, another Chinese, a large Chinese developer, market cap 40 billion, um, disclosed in a filing on Thursday that it will only allow institutional investors to buy seven of its Shanghai traded bonds effective Friday. So existing retail investors must sell or hold until maturity. So they're not allowing to sell those bonds to uh, retail investors anymore. So we're just starting to see uh, how the government is reacting to this by forcing these group, these developers to stop lending to retail investors to try and curb the issues. And what's going to happen there is Chinese developers are going to see a lack of demand, which we're already seeing, and that lack of demand is going to force 75% of Chinese investments into a negative yield. Obviously, 75% of Chinese uh, the Chinese population has their investments in the property sector. They're not really in the stock market like in the US. A lot of their wealth is held in the Chinese property sector. And if we start to see a decline in the property sector like we're already seeing, uh, we're going to see a massive hit on Chinese investments. And beyond that, we're going to see a massive hit on consumer uh, uh, spending as Chinese in, uh investors see their wealth declining, they're going to start to curb back on their investment or on their consumer spending. And that consumer spending is going to hit the overall economy and we believe it's going to hit the global economy. So what we're seeing here is Kaiser already down 56% from their June, July highs and from their peak in June last year, down 56% from the peak in June, July. And what we're seeing 
uh, is even worse. In Shimar Group Holdings, with a market cap of 40.6 billion, where they are down 77.45% from the highs. So we're seeing a massive collapse in the Chinese property sector, and that's definitely going to unwind into the global and the general economy. Beyond that, we're seeing, as we said, the shadow banking um, and kind of under the reg, uh, regulatory framework uh, radar, uh, these things are starting to come to light. We're seeing a probe into Evergrande links to a regional bank posing a new threat. A sale of 1.5 billion stake prompts concerns Chinese developer relied on lender uh, it part owned for financing. So it basically owned the bank and it relied on that bank for lending. And obviously, if it's doing that, that lending is not happening in a prudent manner. It's not happening in a manner that is safe for the globe, for the Chinese economy. So Chinese top banking regulator is said to complete an investigation into the relationship between Evergrande and little known Chinese regional bank, which could pose a new threat to the world's most indebted property group. Chinese media reports in May that the China Banking and Insurance Regulator Commission, the country's top banking regulator, was examining more than $15 billion of transactions involving the Shenzhen headquarter developer Shenyang Bank, a Hong Kong listed lender it part owned. So we're seeing that same uh, kind of corrupt banking financing of these uh, overheated property markets that we saw in the US in 08. And these are starting to come to light more and more in China. And as we said earlier, keeping in mind that if this is happening across the board in the Chinese property sector, we know that 10 of the largest developers owe a combined 1.65 trillion in debt that may, may potentially be going uh, bad or will be considered as non-performing loans. Um, and as we said, what we're already seeing is that the Chinese property developers' uh, fundraising has slumped at its fastest pace this year in October. So we're seeing those, those lending criteria drop as the property market starts to uh, pop or the bubble starts to pop. We're seeing property lenders seeing their lowest levels of uh, funding uh, since uh, October last year. So Chinese property developers fundraising slumped at the fastest pace this year in October, even after the government urged financial institutions to meet the real estate sector's reasonable funding needs. Property developers raised a total of 36.5 billion yuan of funding in October, slumping 74.8% from a year earlier and falling by 60% from the previous month. So there's a massive slump in lending, which means there's a massive slump in development going on, which means the Chinese property sector is under massive pressure, which means the 75% of Chinese population that has their wealth in Chinese property are going to be under massive pressure as well. Uh, and beyond that, we saw that Evergrande officially de defaulted um, the DMSA is preparing bankruptcy proceedings against Evergrande Group. This was reported by Yahoo Finance. Um, the DMSA is the Deutsche uh, Market Screening Agency, so German Market Screening Agency. So you can see how um, this Evergrande situation is starting to turn into contagion with the German Market Screening Agency already recognizing the default at the time and provided in a study that the bankruptcy of Evergrande, the world's most indebted corporation, could ultimately lead to a great reset, i.e. the final meltdown of the global financial system. Final meltdown is a bit of a strong word, but uh, a meltdown nonetheless is definitely on the cards. Uh, this is kind of mixed news because Evergrande was said to make payments uh, in its uh, some of its debt, but some uh, of the local China newspapers, uh, this is the Yuan Talks, is reporting that that grace period ended in October um, and the, the public was, was misread by rumors about alleged interest payments. So there's a lot of mixed news coming out of China that did, de did Evergrande default, did it not? But what we saw is that the German market screening agency is already recognized that it is in default. So it's really started to occur or really starting to unwind in China this week. And we can expect that to occur moving forward. And what we saw the Financial Times reporting is that the Fed warns that ailing China real estate sector poses risk to the U.S. economy. So previously we saw exactly that we saw from Lehman in 2008, they said the risks were contained and now as time goes on, we started to see that the risk of contagion is climbing with the Fed um, warning in its semi-annual financial stability report that stresses in the Chinese real estate sector pose some risk to the U.S. financial system, pointing to heavily indebted property companies such as Evergrande as a potential source of global contagion. So things really starting to occur 
um, and really starting to unwind pretty quickly in China as things unfold. As we've been calling for this emerging market debt crisis since Q2, we're really starting to see things accelerate heading into uh, the end of the year. So beyond uh, the China property risks, we're seeing China flight data uh, really collapse this week. Uh, China August air passenger traffic down 51.5% year on year due to COVID outbreaks. So uh, adding to the pressure that we're seeing in the Chinese economy is COVID. We're seeing um, China's busiest airport um, arrivals dropping to 745 compared to 1285 in 2020, which was kind of in the midst of COVID, and 1363 in 2019. So we're seeing a massive drop in China's busiest airport, and China's second busiest airport is dropping to below, or below the crisis that we saw in COVID in 2020. That's gone to record levels, um, or approaching record levels from the 2020 COVID um, peak. Uh, so you can just see how bad things are in China in terms of the COVID lockdown, which is obviously going to have a massive effect on the Chinese consumer and the Chinese economy in general. And then moving beyond that and adding to the issues that we have in China is the inflation risks building. And when we see China's inflation risk build as producers pass on costs to consumers. Um, and we saw a widening gap. The factory inflation continues to rise faster than CPI, which also picked up so producer prices, factory prices, or inflation, uh, or the PPI, producer price inflation, raising to over 10-year record, um, which is obviously going to get passed on to the Chinese consumer. So it's kind of just a perfect storm for the Chinese consumer, uh, where the property market is uh, popping. Uh, the... COVID is hitting even harder, and we started to see that roll into inflation, which is going to get passed on to the consumer. So China's in big trouble here, as we've been saying uh, for the last six months, and things are really starting to accelerate now. Moving out of China into the USA, which we've been saying for the last few weeks, where we believe the US is in for an economic slowdown as well, that as we were discussing in our video about the US and China being a perfect storm, we started to see the US consumer hit as well and the US uh, economy slow down um, too as US consumer sentiment uh, drops to 10-year lows on inflation fears. So as you can see, consumer sentiment in a nice strong decline from April 2021 and hitting decade lows uh, this week. And then finally, moving to global news, Asia earnings growth on the decline. Again, we're seeing that contagion out of China as Asian earnings heading to uh, new lows. Asia's earnings growth slowed considerably in the latest quarter, putting the region's already lackluster stock markets further behind its peers. Um, Asian stocks are on track to underperform global peers by most since 1998, uh, which is obviously back down to the Asian financial crisis, which we've been saying for the last kind of six months. And you can expect basically an Asian financial crisis 2.0, but you can expect that to spread into the global economy as globalization has really increased since 1994. So it's just one big systemic global financial crisis on its way as a result of an Asian financial crisis 2.0. Um, and then obviously high yield bonds sending that signal that what we're seeing is the Asian uh, high yield collapsing um, what we have here in the yellow or orange is the emerging market high yield bonds collapsing. As we mentioned last week, that uh, yields on these bonds were at 20 year highs um, and climbing uh, rapidly. So you're just seeing the bond market kind of showing you exactly what's happening. And then purple, we have the US high yield bond or high yield corporate bond. And that's starting to turn as well, breaking down out of this trend line. Um, and when we look at the higher time frame charts, which we'll get to later, we can just see that we're looking for a kind of global, uh, that the global risks are on the rise here. Um, high yield bonds in the emerging markets uh, leading the way and corporate bond, uh, high yield corporate bond yields in the US are sure to follow when you look at what's happening. This gap is sure to close. It's not going to close because emerging markets uh, bonds catch a bid in this scenario. It's going to be a scenario where the US starts to feel that global unwind and US bonds start to collapse further.
Good things to watch on the economic calendar this week. Monday, we have Japan GDP. It could be an indicator of potentially more of a global or that Asian contagion that we're seeing from the Evergrande situation, the Chinese uh, property bubble popping. We may start to see that in ja uh, Japanese GDP figures as their economy starts to slow as a result. We also have China retail sales, obviously going to be another big number because if China retail sales start to slump, that's showing that it's really starting to spread to the, U uh, to the Chinese consumer and we do have a contagion event. On Tuesday, we have UK unemployment figures. Uh, Euro GDP numbers and U.S. retail sales. Obviously, U.S. Retail, uh, retail sales will be a big, big indicator of what we may be seeing in terms of a U.S. slowdown in the U.S. economy um, and a good indicator that this kind of contagion situation or that China-U.S. perfect storm, which we've been calling for, is starting to come into play. Wednesday, we have U.K. inflation figures. Thursday, we have Philadelphia Fed Manufacturing Survey, again, potentially showing that economic slowdown in the U.S., which we expect is on the way or on the horizon. And Friday, we have Canada retail sales. Obviously, the Chinese consumer plays a massive role in Canada retail figures, uh, and that could, again, show that contagion flowing out of the Asian financial system. So let's get into the chart to just see what the dollar is saying about all of this. So starting with the dollar, obviously last week with news of inflation on the rise and the Fed looking to taper, we saw the dollar making new highs. Um, and there's still a structure that indicates there's a potential pullback on the dollar, as we've been saying, uh, although it is low probability given what we're seeing in a lot of these other dollar pairs. So it may also be kind of euro based, where the euro could see a little bit of a rally from this region. Uh, we still have some MACD divergence that's on the cards uh, and this big structure. But as we've been saying for weeks now, it's very possible that this was what we call a wave failure rather than a corrective wave, meaning that all of this impulse to the downside is actually part of its own impulse and not part of a corrective structure. So just something we have to keep an eye on, um, but there's still plenty of long dollar trades that we have on the cards that we have running that will definitely uh, or look to be high probability of paying pretty handsomely. We have the pound US dollar that's on the run that's working pretty well um, coming out of this big corrective structure and showing massive downside. Obviously we've moved pretty strongly on the lower time frames over the last kind of week since the BOE uh, surprised markets with its uh, lack of interest in hiking rates. Um, we're waiting for a corrective structure in this region to confirm this continuation to the downside, um, in which case we'll look for the short, but that's definitely looking really bullish or really bearish for the pound, really bullish for the dollar, uh, the pound looking weak across the board. Aussie dollar, US dollar, uh, our trade that we've been running for some time now, basically since August, now kind of back towards break even and breaking lower out of this bigger ABC structure. If you guys remember, we spoke about a move from here up to make new highs at the 7540 region and then a turnaround from there. And that's exactly what we've been seeing. And we suspect that this impulse is going to continue to the downside. And we're going to continue to see the US dollar rally, uh, especially against these commodity pairs. New Zealand dollar, US dollar, same thing. Nice big ABC running flat structure and breaking lower as we've been calling for for the last couple of weeks. And that's really starting to play out uh, now. US dollar CAD is another one breaking higher out of our little lower time frame structure, which we called for a couple of weeks back. ABC, lower time frame running flat and a huge pop out of that. And when we zoom out all the way to the weeklies, I believe this is just the start of the move of the US dollar CAD going to new highs. So you can expect the CAD to be pretty weak as well uh, coming out of this bigger structure. US dollar Swiss, our trade of the week last week, if you guys remember, now pretty much uh, comfortably in the money uh, with a pretty long way to run. I mean, it's a trade of the week, but this is going to take a couple of months to play out and should get us all the way up to 95 to the upside with a risk reward ratio of about four to one. So it's a really nice trade uh, and it's starting to run pretty nicely, uh, breaking out of this bigger structure as we explained in last week's trade of the week. The US dollar yen breaking higher. Uh, coming out of a pretty confusing little structure here, potentially a little bit of a zigzag correction breaking higher from there. We still have some upside on the cards in the US dollar yen trade, believing this should top out at around about 117 before the yen starts to kind of take its full hold as a risk off currency uh, once again as a risk reserve 
a kind of safe haven currency, excuse me, moving forward. Uh, the rest of the US dollar pair, uh, sorry, the rest of the yen pairs looking particularly weak. So that yen uh, safe haven kind of structure already sh starting to show in things like the Aussie, the New Zealand, the CAD and the Swiss. So that really starting to see that shift in momentum from risk on towards a more risk off scenario. Uh, with the, the yen regaining its safe haven status. Silver, as we mentioned we, last week, there's a good chance we're going to see a big strong bounce in silver heading up towards our kind of 25 to 26 full target, a full target being 26.25 to the upside, in which case we believe we're going to see a big turn to the downside from there. So you can kind of watch US dollar, yen and silver together. You'll see silver topping out first and the US dollar yen following suit as we head into that deflationary kind of debt crisis trade uh, that we've been watching for for many months now. So silver, a good indicator, a good leading indicator is what we're seeing. Everyone's looking at inflation now this week with silver breaking higher. There's a very high probability we're going to top out at 26. Silver's going to lose its shine and we're going to see a big, big drop. And once we said, or as we said, once we break 2140 to the downside, there's a massive floor underneath that or a massive hole in the floor underneath that. And that's going to drop really, really quickly. Gold kind of showing the same thing. Structurally, I still believe we're in this expanding triangle. Um, we might see gold kind of losing its shine this week as well as it tops out in this region and starts to move back down to the lows at 1680 um, and that will kind of be a choppy move uh, as the structure plays out not as clean and clear as silver uh, but we'll see this eventually clear itself out as the structure reveals itself copper a little bit of a rally loss uh, to end the week but as you can see on the dailies we're still down a good uh, seven percent from the highs and this should continue to melt to the downside Go to the lower time frames we're seeing all of this just kind of big impulse off the highs and then going into a little bit of a corrective structure in here which should unfold with another impulse to the downside eventually so watching for that and then platinum kind of the same thing just waiting for this turnaround in platinum as its higher time frame structure another nice corrective move could get as high as 120 120 um, before turning to the downside that becomes an expanding flat uh, but definitely the structure to me is indicating further downside in precious metals and then once again just moving to uh, these yen pairs the pound yen breaking lower continues to break lower obviously the pound very very weak leading the way Aussie dollar yen also looking pretty toppy may see a little bit of a rally this week uh, but if you guys remember our 2021 forecast for the yen, we expected a pop up into this kind of 85 to 89 region and then a fall down from there. And what we're seeing in the pound yen is indicating that we may have topped out already. You're seeing this kind of double top in uh, the kind of on the daily chart, on the eight hour chart, we're seeing that double top. Um, and we're seeing a lack of momentum to the upside that's starting to fade and we're waiting for that confirmation that we've seen a turn in the Aussie dollar yen and we're really heading into that risk off environment. New Zealand dollar yen same thing kind of topping out heading lower um, structures the same CAD yen one of the cleaner uh, structures on the higher time frames as you can see you got this beautiful ABC corrective structure uh, you've got some MACD divergence on the weekly, so you're seeing a change of momentum to the upside. When we go into lower time frames, you're seeing a kind of topping out um, and an acceleration to the downside. This looks like it's ready to accelerate to the downside out of this little running flat that we have on the four hour, and this should continue out of this little flag to the downside. And that's a pretty good looking trade, especially with the CAD looking so weak against the US dollar. Um, this should really start to accelerate. So again, across the board, these yen pairs are looking pretty strong, which just shows you that we are heading into a more risk on environment. Same with the Swiss yen. We've seen a little bit of a topping out, MACD uh, dropping off. Uh, and in this instance, you can see a little bit of a head and shoulders structure forming here. And once that breaks to the downside, that's going to indicate um, that the, the yen is starting to shine once again as that risk off or that safe haven currency. Oil still kind of chopping around. I believe we're going to be in correction here for some time, probably until kind of mid to late December. So just watching that market for a new long entry um, or the indication that we've actually turned uh, in that market. Some of these emerging market currencies, US dollars are going into correction, breaking higher. 
um, as we've been calling for basically since 1340. We had a strong rally at 1340, gone into this bigger ABCDE triangle and are breaking higher out of that with a break and retest of the triangle. We expect some choppiness in here before we fully break out and we are already long kind of from the 1460 region um, with quite a kind of irresponsibly long as Ra Powell mentions in the US dollar czar uh, and the emerging market currency is looking pretty similar. US dollar Korean won kind of struggling to break higher. Looks like it's getting defended pretty strongly with these high wicks. Every time it breaks out of this region it pulled back strongly but structurally speaking, we see this eventually breaking to the upside, going all the way out to the weeklies, uh, even the monthlies, out of this big wedge. And as you can see, this whole big wedge started with an impulse to the upside, which all began basically the Asian financial crisis in 95, 96, kind of accelerating into 97. And we suspect the same thing moving forward, a slow kind of start uh, to that acceleration to the upside, and then uh, eventually it goes parabolic to the upside as these Asian financial uh, or these Asian markets kind of break down as we've been seeing in the news that matters those yields or those earnings in the Asian stock markets are breaking down and the currencies are going to follow and then into the crypto space Bitcoin um, weekly charts still an absolute mess still pretty confusing but we're seeing a little bit of respite on the four hour and hourly charts where you've got this really clean corrective structure on the hourlies Got a nice little A wave down, nice choppy B wave up, and then the C wave is really starting to come into its own, potentially going to bottom out at around about 60,000. And if that is the case, uh, using our what we call a structured day trade strategy, once the entry presents itself, we have a beautiful little corrective structure which indicates an upside target of around about um, 86,000 to the upside uh, on the hourly chart. Again, I said, like I said, the higher time frames are really not as clear as I would like them to be, but we started to see some nice clear patterns on the lower time frames, which look pretty tradable to me and something we'll be watching out for in the members area. We'll be looking for that entry and looking to gain that uh, basically 40% upside in the crypto markets of this potential trade. So very good risk reward on these trades. Uh, but again, that caveat that the higher time frames aren't as clear. And then Ethereum showing a kind of a similar picture with this bigger ABC running flat. We'll see a move down towards 34-ish, 3400, and then a big acceleration to the upside from there. Um, and maybe all of this will turn out into a much bigger, more complex corrective structure moving forward. Not quite sure how the debt crisis is going to hit Bitcoin and Ethereum and the crypto market in general, because there's two uh, there's two schools of thought where we have a big risk off rally and Bitcoin and Ethereum and these risk assets in the crypto space get hit really hard or um, this kind of collapse of currencies in emerging markets leads to those markets heading into the Bitcoin space to preserve their wealth, preserve their currency, um, and Bitcoin catches a massive bid. So we have kind of two things at play there which we need to watch for. But generally speaking, I'm long Bitcoin, um, and these are just kind of uh, looking for areas to trade around on the lower time frame, to trade around that long-term hold, as I've been saying. It's cool, guys. As you can see, lots to watch this week. We'll be keeping a close eye on the dollar to see what's happening there. We're keeping a close eye on uh, those high yield bonds um, in the US uh, and uh, those US economic numbers, which may start to show a turnaround um, and a kind of corner that the Fed has painted itself into where it needs to raise rates into a weakening economy, which is going to hit the markets really hard. So we'll be watching for that. Members, we'll see you in the members area for tomorrow's strategy session for the week and for Monday in general. Uh, we'll see you in the Monday afternoon or US hours Monday morning for the US equity market session. Um, and the rest of you, we'll see next week. If you are interested in joining our members area, you're welcome to check us out at Cynicalytics.com uh, and check me out on Twitter at Cynicalytics. And uh, if you're more interested in a more investment framework, we're launching our investor series this week, our investor guidance uh, service on our website, which is a little bit less than the trading section um, and a little bit more uh, passive for you where we do the work, we find the best investments for you and we spread that news to you, showing you the full breakdown of the stocks you want to buy. We'll be launching that this week. Uh, so if you're interested, keep an eye on that. Um, the rest of you have a good one and we'll chat again next week.